Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Codex uh, group meeting. Um, we have two uh, exciting presentations uh, today. Uh, we have uh, Tom Martin, uh, the founder of Lawdroid, who will be speaking. Uh, Tom uh, came all the way down from Vancouver to uh, be with us here today. And then we have uh, Mary Jutten, uh, uh, CEO uh, of uh, Tracklight and Managing Director of Evolve Law, who will be uh, discussing her latest book on uh, small law KPIs. Um, before we get started, uh, I was uh, hoping that I could just get a sort of a quick uh, update from folks. Uh, if anyone has any kind of news to report or any uh, requests for the group, please, uh, please share. Let us know. Uh, you, if you are online, you have to unmute yourself. Anyone? I'll throw Anything? something in like I usually do. Yeah. Uh, it's Monica. Go ahead, Monica. Uh, first, I want to tell all you guys how fantastic the conference was. I've just heard thing after thing after thing, and, and boy, oh boy, did you guys do a great job. I'm just so proud of it. Um, for those of you who may have gone or been there, um, I would just encourage you to ping me. Um, the easiest one is monicabay1 at gmail.com. If you'd like to write a blog post, I'm really determined to bring in new, new writers. If you're working on something that you're excited about, give me a call and it's really easy and, and we'd love to start, start getting more voices in the blog. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Monica. All right. Any, anyone else uh, has any updates? No. All right. Go ahead. Uh, Woodland University and School on our nonprofit side has two prospective committed undergraduate students. One in North Africa, one in the states. Good. <laughs> That's good news. For, as we begin to accredit. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Well, if there's no no further updates, I'll 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 turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Roland. So I'm Tom Martin, I'm a Yale philosophy major, lawyer, technophile, and entrepreneur. I'm a co-founder of Vancouver uh, Legal Hackers. Actually, Joshua Lennon is my co-founder. Ah, he okay. Was a speaker at Codex. I wish I could have gone, but I. Oh, okay. Him. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, he gave a <laughs> a pretty uh, good overview over the. Uh, I, you know, I didn't know that he's working on. Uh, on chatbots himself. <laughs> is he? No, wait, this is your. your no, no, no. He, he's. A, I'm sorry. He's my co-founder on Vancouver Legal Hackers. Ah, oh, okay. I thought on chatbots. No, okay, no, that was so, it. <laughs> yeah, so it's, he's been quite. A, yeah, quite a, a skeptical voice. On the, no, and I think. But, I mean, he guy. gave a great perspective. I thought. But. And I think he has excellent questions about chatbots. Yeah. Yeah. I'll probably get into some of those, and I'm, you know, open to any of you asking, you know skeptical questions about this because it only improves it. Right. Right. Um, so I created LawDroid, and it's an AI legal assistant to help people solve their legal problems. Uh, I spent too much time on Twitter, so this uh, was just something I kind of liked. You know, Jeff Bezos was saying that, you know, kind of like uh, Henry Ford, that, you know, your customer would tell you a faster horse. Kind of the same thing here. Um, you want to look at what the possibilities are, not necessarily the immediate needs of your, of your customer. And so chatbots are a way of creating a whole new dialogue with a legal client where you could only not only provide legal documentation, but advice as well and information. So one of the openings for chatbots right now is that apps, you know, the number of apps is pretty much flatlined. Um, Ten years ago, of course, it was the opposite. It was just hockey puck growth, and now it's just stagnated. And as we all know, there's just so many apps. Where do you look? You know, <laughs> where would you start to look? Um, in contrast, um, messenger apps like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger have just had explosive growth over the last couple of years. Uh, WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger reading, uh, reaching about one billion monthly active users and uh, actually outstripping other social media, like Facebook itself. Told you. Sorry, could you folks online, you see the slides, by the way, because I saw somebody text that you don't get, get uh, 
don't see the slides. Do you see the slides? If you could give a give us a sign. Yeah, I think that was me earlier before the the images before came up. Okay, so you you see you see the you see Tom's slides. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. And actually, these uh, messaging platforms have outstripped uh, now traditional social media like uh, Facebook and and others. So this all came to a head um, in April 2016, where a number of different platforms were, were launched from Facebook, Line, Kick, and uh, Samsung had its voice bot that it launched. Of course, Siri already existed, but it's been pretty quick development of this entire area of chatbots, where you have chatbots that are just text-based, voice-based, and uh, launching the various messaging platforms to accommodate them. And so in the last three months of 2016, um, you had Google launch its own AI assistant, Hello, and um, also Google acquired API.ai, which is a pretty interesting platform that I'll talk a little bit more about later. So these are the reasons why chatbots are going to and have just had ex exponential growth practically is that it doesn't have the same friction that apps do. Um, you don't have to download it, you don't have to install it, and uh, they're very quickly available. This is the figure, 34,000 chatbots that existed in December 2016 on Facebook Messenger, from zero to 34,000 from April to December. So it's been taken up very quickly. 83% um, is the percentage that U.S. Magistrate Judge uh, John Cacciolo, Cacciola estimated that that amount of people don't go to lawyers to get legal advice or services. So there's an entire latent market that's been discussed for a long time that's not being addressed. Why do lawyers get such a bad rap? I saw that just outside here. And uh, I love that because the answer is one that I experience every single day because I am a practicing California lawyer, um, and so I have experience day in, day out with clients providing them with advice, and, you know, you become part of the problem. You know, psychological projection is a very powerful thing. And uh, people entwine you in, in, in the problem and become fr frustrated with, with that. So... The problem to solve here is, is, yes, the perception of lawyers being overpriced and people avoid using them. Um, also, the fact that you're dealing with a chatbot, which is more of an, it's not a person, allows that kind of distance so that you're not having that projection that, that occurs normally with a uh, real lawyer. Price point is, of course, extremely important. And there isn't really an easy way yet to interact on smartphones and get legal services. So the solution right now, and this is just a very specific solution, is a chatbot that can help small business people and entrepreneurs launch their business by answering a few questions on their smartphone through a chatbot. Unlike LegalZoom or Rocket Lawyer or any of the un other online service providers, you don't have to have a top-heavy uh, staff to support it. LegalZoom has around 600 employees that provide support services. With a chatbot, you could automate most all of this and you don't have these problems. Market validation is already there. You have a million businesses already be, have been formed with LegalZoom, hundreds of tag along uh, online service providers that are pretty much identical to LegalZoom in terms of providing a website-based interaction. The market size for this type of service there's about 3.6 million small businesses in California and 100,000 new businesses every year. Now there's a lower percentage of them that actually incorporate, but I wanted to start with this test market because unlike British Columbia, you know, in California you have close to 40 million people and it's a good market to start with as a niche. So this is the product. You pull up Facebook Messenger, search for Type in LawDroid and it brings up this bot. 
And the unique selling proposition is part of it is the name, uh, which it actually has an older name on here, Law Robot. But it's uh, Law Droid. Uh, the ease of use, you could just low friction, just answer some questions and get it done. And at this point, I just want to jump out of this for a second and show you the web version of it. So this is a demo. Hi, I'm Tom Martin. Here's a short demo. Once you launch the app, it initially gets to know you a little bit, um, tells you it's not a lawyer, very first thing, to make sure that that's clear. And at every point, the person is you know, stating that they understand this, they understand this is a limitation on what they're getting, and it goes through disqualifications. A bit hard to read, but what it's saying is, hey, are you trying to set up a bank? Can't do that yet. You know, are you trying to set up multiple classes of stock? Well, I can't do that yet. But for the person who is starting a business, it's fairly simple. This would qualify them and let them proceed. Then it informs them that they have uh, obligations like the $100 state filing fee, which is not part of what's charged here, uh, that there's an $800 minimum franchise tax, so the person is surprised by that. It has an ability to check the corporate name to make sure it's not used by anyone else. And then once it's confirmed that it's not in use, gathers the information essentially filling in the articles of incorporation form. So through this process, as you can see right at the top, it, it asks, you know, would you want us to be your agent for service to process? And that's a $99 per year recurring subscription fee that they don't have to opt, in, opt into. They could say that they're going to be the registered agent and just fill in their information, but it's an upsell opportunity. Now, if somebody does not opt into any of the upsells, it's a completely free service. So for the entrepreneur who's on a tight budget and just wants to launch their business, they could do so without having to pay anything. So when they proceed further, um, it asks how many shares they want and if they'd like us to file it for them as the incorporator. If they do that, that's an additional small fee. And so we're just about getting to the end here. But can you can you pay then through the, through your chatbot, or does that sort of take you somewhere else? So this is this is version one. On version one, no. <laughs> but what I do is I use the emails that I grab from them to send them an invoice where they can pay online by just clicking the button on the invoice. Ah, okay, cool. Minimal viable product to get it out. <laughs> um, but that is now a possibility to do that on Facebook. Right here, it presents you with the Articles of Incorporation as a PDF document. As you can see, it's completed by the answers to the questions. Uh, on this one, I think on the back, it had my information because I would be filing it for them. There's an opportunity for them to share that they just launched their company and they're excited about it and put that on social media so they could share that this is a resource that other people can use. And that's the demo. Cool. So there's a few upsell opportunities in, in the chatbot. Now, the market, as we know, is about a $400 billion market, but that's not what I'm going after. The late market I was talking about is this, on the far left side, the $232 average budget of most Americans. That works out to about a $74 billion market. Now, not everyone's going to have immediate legal needs, but that's a fairly sizable market. It actually is larger than the $60 billion small business market. Um, and so 
starting Lodroid with incorporations is the first step in this. Uh, but like I said, I wanted to start with a smaller niche that I could target. Um, I'm the founder. I, what I do is content and design, so I put the conversations together to make sure that we don't get any legal trouble. Uh, draw on my experience to ask the right questions and make sure that the right people are using the app. Uh, Katya uh, works with me. She's based out of Estonia, and she helps to uh, get this all put together technically. Um, you could <laughs> definitely follow me on Twitter, Lodroid1, and I'm just absolutely uh, thrilled. I flew down here for this because I consider it a great honor, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, um, awesome. So, what, what, so what do you think? Um, how do you think this whole phenomenon of uh, chatbot in the law will sort of evolve over the next couple of years? Do you think it's going to be like? Uh, you know, separate, you know, companies that take advantage of these technologies and use it in, you know, maybe initially in consumer-facing applications? Do you think that's something that even business law firms, larger law firms might take advantage of for, you know, for intake and, and uh, to, you know, try to provide some of their kind of maybe more commoditized uh, expertise to clients and use it as sort of an... Uh, Kind of maybe business development thing initially, or how how do you see this evolve for the next couple of years? The thing right now with chatbots is that there is no like clear picture yet of what kind of role they're going to play. Uh -huh. So it, it's kind of like this clay that hasn't been molded yet, and everybody's trying to take their you know stab at it mm -hmm. and, and make it their own. I see all of that happening. Everyone's going to try to to use it to their advantage. I've already been approached by other lawyers that I work work with or have come to know where they're saying, hey, you've done this. I think, you know, I have this idea. I'd like to do something similar or I'd like to launch this entirely new type of, uh, of bot. Uh, one lawyer that I spoke to, he wants, he would like to put on his website one, a, a chat bot where it would gather initial information and basically act as kind of like a, a, a you know, face to the front of his law firm where, the, you know, 24-7 you could have this, this chatbot doling out in basic information and then gathering leads and qualifying them so the better ones get kicked up to him. Mm -hmm. um, but I also see this functioning at a, at a, more, at a higher level. You, you could have companies like H&R Block or, you know, that have that recurring relationship with people using it as a way of funneling uh, additional business to themselves as just a value-added service. Mm -hmm. um, and then law firms, larger law firms as well. Yeah. Do you have a web-based portal as, in addition to the, or, or is this the only way to get to So the, the website I have is, is lawdroid.com. Now the start incorporating button, it does take them to Facebook the Messenger. So, like, if you click on that, so the answer is no, I don't. Okay. Yes. Um, the reason for that, other you just is your business, you just think that's where the future is. Or? So back in June, July, uh, when I was looking at different platforms, Facebook Messenger was just nearing a billion of the active users on its Messenger platform. I thought that was the way to go, not only in terms of the number of users, but the fact that if you go on Facebook and then you try to advertise against it, get people to use it. The demographic information that you could get is just astounding. You know, you could you could slice and dice people down to their their age, uh, occupation. You know, you could advertise to uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, people that read Entrepreneur Magazine. You know, and, and that's pretty amazing to be able to to do that. Well, and I'm actually, not, I'm not saying you should have done that instead not, of this. I'm only asking why you're not doing both. Oh, it was just the first step. Okay. And. Um, so there's a 2.0 version of, of LawDroid where um, this one was coded in Python. This new version takes advantage of the API.ai platform, which allows me an ease of creating conversations and designing them through, through that uh, UI. And then uh, in addition to that, we have document assembly that we've used with uh, – there's a – open source um, 
project called docassemble.org, which you probably heard about. Yeah. We created an API for it so we could just push information to it um, and use that for document creation. And now, through API.ai, you can integrate with multiple different platforms. So we're now going to be pushing it onto Skype and uh, Slack and various other platforms that are available. Uh, my name is Layla. Thanks so much for coming. Actually, I'm a uh, founder of Startup Documents, so um, we do incorporation and uh, doc gen as well. Um, really interesting, I think. Um, I have a thousand questions for you, but I'm only going to ask maybe two or three. Um, and the first is, uh, so I like the concept of chat, chat bot. Um, I'm, I, I was reading through your you know, I mean, I was trying to read through. It's hard. It was hard to read the the type in the uh, in the video that you were playing back. Yeah. Um. It doesn't seem like it's a true chat feature, though. It seems like it's a if this then that yes no. You're giving them the answers they select, right? So it's not like I'm conversationally typing, and there's a bot that's understanding my inputs and basically creating an output based on that, right? Right. Okay, so that's the first, I guess that's more of a comment, is that would be cool to see. Um, yes and no. So this is version 1.0, like I said, and, and now the second version has natural language processing. The second version has machine learning. And yeah, you can more naturally enter information and it, it works a little more naturally. Mm -hmm. Reason why I said no is because from a UI standpoint and designing the flow of the conversation that you want to have in terms of getting the information you need or creating the documents, you don't want that conversation to go too far, you know, out of line. You, you want it to gather, you know, X, Y, Z. And yeah, they might have, oh, well, by the way, what is the minimum, what's this minimum franchise tax you're talking about? And then maybe have something to assist on that. But in general, you want to keep people, you know, fairly narrow conversation and actually Thomas Lewis who's a tech evangelist for Microsoft in Vancouver basically that's their group's approach too is to keep things fairly um, you know on the rails and then Facebook just recently rolled, it, rolled out an additional feature where it actually prevents people from throwing in like side you know conversations it basically keeps them on the quick replies where it's like yes or no dot 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 so Okay, so I appreciate. I disagree. I don't think there's a no. I think that I'm I'm, I'm not asking. I'm just saying that it would be more interesting if there was a, a conversational aspect to it. And there are applications that do that and do it quite successfully, actually. So it, it would be cool to see that. And then the second thing is, um, how did you decide to do California formation, and why did you decide to do that? Uh, like I said before, I mean California is a very large market, and to me that seemed like the one I would want to go after. I also am a California lawyer, so it's one that I already know about. So that's why I decided on California. Interesting. Okay. Um, no, no plans for Delaware? That's probably the next one, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and then where did you get the data that uh, Americans have $232 to spend on legal services as a budget? Yeah, this is uh, Bill Henderson. Yeah. Oh, I see. That, that, that okay. Client, uh, yeah. A year ago, so it's just yeah. from, and he based it on U.S. Census. Oh, is that right? Census data. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. I, I mean, sort of, it's meant to kind of add up to. The, some people say the latent demand for legal services is, yeah. you know, the people who need them but don't, can't afford them or don't mm -hmm. know they need them. It's about forty-five billion dollars or so. It's what I see people. Mm. Yeah. That's very interesting yeah, to me. I hadn't seen that before, so I just wanted to say that that's really. I, I don't look into that. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Um, Michelle Colucci. Uh, so how um, do you acquire customers? What's your outreach yeah, model? So, you know, Facebook is, is one way of doing it okay. through Facebook ads. Um, so ads, okay. Ads. Yeah, you can look at, you know, different people that are following similar kinds of subject matters. Right. Yeah, sure. uh, AdWords, I've already tested that. Of course, it's, it works, yeah. but it's extremely expensive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But also, like advertising-based model, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Uh, I want what? to throw in a, a question I should have asked during during future law. You're going to laugh at me, but what is a chat bot and when did it show up? <laughs> a, a chat bot is a program that simulates a human conversation and it shows up in, in, in different ways. Uh, one is if you're on, on uh, Facebook Messenger, um, you, could, you could do a search or like one example is Logroid. If you, if you put Logroid in, into the search button on Facebook Messenger, it would bring up my bot. But there's also some for uh, like 1-800-Flowers has a chat bot on there where you could order flowers by using a bot. Um, TechCrunch also has an interesting one that gives you some information about what's going on in the industry. You said that you, you, you get a, a kind of a wealth of uh, demographic information by using uh, the, face, the Facebook Messenger plat platform. Are there any interesting demographics you found uh, in this user base of your chatbot? I mean, who are the users? And Yeah, I didn't, I didn't include that. Um, but it's who you would expect. I mean, it's like 20, 20 to 35 year old, you know, it's the majority mm -hmm. of, of users. Um, just because this is, I mean, this is what, where most everyone lives, is on messaging, but I think more so uh, where it's just the very first go-to mode of communication is for 20 to 35-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the majority, and, and it does trend the majority male. Mm -hmm. But um, And what kind, of, what kind of businesses are incorporated on it? Do, do you track that too? I mean... Like is it uh, tech businesses or are you all kinds across no, the garden variety? Not of... really tech because they go more for the Delaware and they mm -hmm. go more for you know complex uh, classes of stock. Yeah, like sure. That. So you know, like one was, um, I think she was starting a makeup company. Mm -hmm. um, the LLCs then or something, California LLCs or so. This is strictly corporations right now. Mm-hmm. But that's the plan is, you know, start small, test, and then, and actually corporations is just a test too, uh -huh. you know. Um, I've also been looking into everything else. Uh, one test spot that I have is around divorce, frequently asked questions and uh -huh. finding information about that. Wills is the next one that I want to put out there because that's more general generalizable where you could have statutory requirements met for most all 50 states mm -hmm. and make that fairly easy to, to to automate. And so that would be a great service, I think, to just provide. It's just typically not on the mind of the, the 20 to 30 year olds, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Is there some kind of guidance if they don't know whether they should be a California LLC or a corporation in California or a corporation in Delaware or anything like that? Do you have some kind of preliminary tool to help them figure that piece out? Nope. Yeah. I mean, it's not everything. It's not everything yet. And it'll, it'll never be, you know. Um, but it's a start. Yeah, thanks. This is exciting. Uh, um, you mentioned it first um, before you started talking uh, to everyone that Vancouver allows you to incorporate or uh, do uh, company sign up online where California doesn't. And I'm curious uh, how you'll navigate both um, the sort of slow questions, how do you get that to be legal in California, or how could that be you know, possible with a chatbot in California? And also maybe the fast questions. You have such a great possible product here, it seems like the workflow could be overwhelming in all these different countries, states. Um, how, how are you gonna manage both the slow question of creating, um, you know, this product available maybe in many different states, many different countries, many different languages, and mm -hmm. also the fast question of how to grow, um, uh, you know, a potential organization that could be really far-reaching in voice um, and would working with other big companies besides Facebook, you mentioned Microsoft, um, you know, Google, TensorFlow, 103 languages and translate. Right. Stanford Law School. Um, I don't know. Yeah. 
uh, and I ask this in the context of developing an online law, you know, online uh, IP open source centric university. We'd like to be in all 200 countries in their main languages. We'd also like to offer law degrees. So there might be a lot of intern law students at some point online Maybe. that could um, potentially collaborate or help out or something. Yeah, right now from a practical standpoint, I've been talking to partners about using them to roll out within 50 states, you know, within a short time period. That's the way that I would tackle that. Um, one thing you mentioned before, it's just strange that uh, in British Columbia, you, you, you can go online and create these things. You know, there, there's not that friction that creates the need for this kind of a service as much up there. Mm -hmm. And I just find it like, when, when I've talked to, to friends of mine, you know, about how, the way it is in California, they just can't believe, you know, they don't believe me, you know, because they think, well, isn't that near Silicon Valley where it's Sacramento like, why, why don't they have like all these, you know, resources to just make things frictionless, just easy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why things haven't changed yet, but, and it's also like that in a number of other states, so I don't want to just pick on California, but uh, it provides this opportunity for, you know, to, to provide a streamlined solution. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the chatbot space, I mean, it also came out of the conversation at the conference. I think there are legitimate questions surrounding it, but I think it's really uh, a really important technology for the for the future. Um, there is some someone else who texted that actually, um, who chatted online, who uh, asked, um, you, know, you forgot to mention that Google acquired uh, API.ai mm -hmm. and also... Uh, what about the, the computer human conversation aspect and connection with the chatbots and the Turing test? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, I give a, a different presentation that addresses a lot of that. And I actually did mention at the beginning of this the Google part API.ai, which opens up some great possibilities uh, because they made it free. You know, so huh. it's a it's a wonderful thing for developers. The Turing test. Well, to define it for people that may not know it, is, is that Turing said that a computer would be deemed to be intelligent if after a five-minute conversation with it, you couldn't tell it from a human being. <laughs> and then one thing I, I noted, because as I said before, I'm a philosophy major, uh, Descartes had a very similar definition from his uh, discourse on method, where you know he was about uh, being skeptical about the nature of reality, and he said, you know, it might be in the future that they may be able to create machines that look like human beings. How could we tell them apart? And his first test was these machines would say things that wouldn't sound relevant, and you would know it that they would, you know, you, you would find them out because they would say things that didn't make sense, mm -hmm. which is essentially the Turing test, yeah. you know, back in the 1630s. Yeah. Um, so... In terms of how we've come so far with that test, in 2011, Cleverbot um, was able to trick people, I think, 68% of the time, uh -huh. 2011. And Turing actually thought we wouldn't get past 30% by, two, by 2000. Mm -hmm. So we've really surpassed what he had in mind. That's interesting. Well, great. Well, thank you for the presentation. Thanks for coming. So, really cool. well, I'll turn it over to Mary now. Um, I don't know. Mary, can you share your screen, please? Oh, there you are. Yes. I've been listening intently. <laughs> great. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Do you want me to just get started then? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah, go go right okay. ahead. Well, thank you very much, Roland. And I just wanted to echo what Monica said about future law. I thought it was really very interesting and very well done. And I bought Jillian's book from my phone sitting in the aisle. I'm excited to read that. Um, so this is my second time at Codex. And uh, the first time I came and talked about 
my company Tracklight, which I still have, and we've morphed that into more of a white label solution um, for attorneys and also for um, for uh, sort of aggregators of small and medium sized businesses. And part of the reason that I ended up writing this book for Thomson Reuters uh, was that I've been struggling with lawyers who don't run their law firms necessarily like businesses. And so I was struggling talking to lawyers about how my day job track light could save them money when they were trying to acquire new clients. And so I ended up writing for a number of different folks um, around uh, around KPIs. And what came out of it was that uh, this this framework or this approach for lawyers to start making data-driven decisions. So um, one of the things, what I wanted to talk about today was just share a little bit of the research that Thomson Reuters did when I was writing the book, which also ties into their state of small law. And although the book was written all around a framework for small law, it really doesn't matter. Um, my background is that I, I'm uh, I'm actually also Canadian. Uh, I know Tom's married to to a Canadian, but I'm now both Canadian and American. Um, but I'm originally an accountant, and uh, I worked using and uh, timesheets when you had to handwrite timesheets. So I've been around billable hours for thirty hours, uh, thirty thirty hours, thirty years now. So. Um, I also have a law degree, but I did not practice law, but I worked at one of Canada's largest law firms as the director of finance, and I can tell you all of this applies equally. So KPIs, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, are, are key performance indicators. But one of the things that I've been talking about a lot lately is that KPIs are not some their financial statements or um, you know anything else that you just sort of check the box or say tick done. It's very much focusing on what the data can tell you in terms of what your problems are. And um, as I like to share with folks who are lawyers, um, Yes, it's a profession, but there are other professions and um, we can borrow in the law from these other professions. And I think that was one of the things that Jillian Hatfield or Professor Hatfield mentioned at Future Law is like, don't leave it to the lawyers. So I don't necessarily think lawyers should be excluded, but I think there's lots of cool things going on, not only in tech, but just in basic management. And for small firms, one of the reasons that they fail is that they don't have enough cash. It's the same reason that startups fail. Um, and that's something that in my, uh, that I wear as, as um, running Evolve Law, this is something we're trying to solve for all of the companies by getting more business for them. And um, there's no point in uh, billing clients or arguing over billable hours versus alternative fees if you um, don't actually collect the money. In, this is from the book, and um, Roland, I understand you don't have your glasses, um, so I'm not going to go through this. I got my, I got my sunglasses. <laughs> yes, they're prescription, so I can, uh, I can follow. <laughs> Thanks, <so. laughs> uh, so I was not going to go through this in detail, but the, the idea is that look at things from a business perspective and there's this misplaced focus on billable hours and that's not to be um you know confused with and i am not advocating for a minute that people don't record what they're doing in fact they should be recording what they're doing whether it's billable or not because that's how businesses figure out whether they're profitable but there is a complete misplaced focus on this billable hour. So just at a really high level, we have this example of this Alan who feels he's a billing machine because his utilization rate is 116%. But when he sits down, um, he's actually for the year uh, about 
14% was never collected. So there's no point in billing a client if you're not going to collect it. So I'm not going to go into these in, in detail. I've actually been, I partnered with the lawyerist with Sam Glover. So if you love spreadsheets, there's a free spreadsheet. Um, there's, it has like five of the metrics in there and the examples from the book. And I did a whole bunch of blogs for him. I think the last one just came out today. Um, so the, Thomson Reuters did their small law firm uh, uh, survey. And then based on that, I asked them to send out a little quick survey. I started writing the book in April and it was due in um, July. So uh, we didn't have time for an extensive survey. And so um, there were 690 sent out, 62, 62 firms responded. And it was a really good kind of mix all law, but it was, um, you know, we had kind of an even distribution. I hated statistics in, uh, in my undergrad, which was not philosophy, Tom, it was commerce. Um, so basically the very interesting thing to me was that, you know, everyone said they use tech uh, practice management, uh, you know, was one of the things that they could be using. And I really don't think that should count as using tech. Um, but more than half of them don't use anything other than billable hours. And then one of the things from the small law survey was that the, the biggest measure of firm success is customer satisfaction, or that's what people report. However, only three of these 62 firms actually do any kind of measure of client satisfaction. And the, you know, when I've been presenting, I was at uh, the tech show and I talked about kind of the concept of an ideal client and client data. And even in the room, some people didn't know what measure you would use for client satisfaction. So there seems to be this big disconnect between the law recognizing that that should be a measure, but then not actually doing it. And this is the one that's a little bit scary. So firms, 31 of the 58 that responded to this question said that they use take home dollars or their bank balance to decide if they're profitable, which is a little bit dangerous as those of us who, you know, balance our checkbook or understand what's going on. I don't use checks anymore, but you know what I mean. So there was this big disconnect for how to run the firm as a business, which it's perfectly fine to not know how to run your firm as a business, but then you need to outsource it and find somebody to do that. So one of the things I did want to talk about, oops, is um, I'm just mindful of the time here, is that um, where the KPIs have really started working are firms that are looking at client measures and whether that's um, their pipeline, the net promoter score that I'm just going to go over after I ask how many people are familiar with it. Um, it. It's this shifting away from focusing on the inputs or how many hours of mic or how many matters, um, you know, am I going to crank through? It's more about what can I do to create satisfied clients because ultimately it's way less expensive to upsell to a an existing client or have those clients refer happy clients refer other people to you that's much cheaper than going out and finding and establishing new client relationships so how many of you are familiar with net promoter score i can't see the chat so okay you're like really tiny about three people in the room. <laughs> three people. Okay. <laughs> See, I took my glasses off for this. Clearly, I should have had them on, Roland. Um, so, net promoter score. If you are an online shopper, um, you will have received this. Uh, you know, you go in. I, I get this a lot. I use Hotels.com. Choice between how is your <clears throat> how is your check in? Happy face, sad face, and then, you know, for a lot of um, folks, it's either a scale of one to 10, or I've seen a scale of one to five. So it's the question would be about your firm on a scale of one to 10, with one being not at all likely and 10 being extremely likely, how likely and XYZ firm or to your colleagues, it really depends like what kind of law firm, you know, what kind of law you're practicing. And that question is, um, creates, you know, 
the ability for someone to give you a ranking from one until 10. And um, this, the on here is how to calculate it. It's basically you're, you're dividing the number of promoters, the people who would basically go and say good things about you. Um, those are the nines or tens. You divide that by the total, and then you take the detractors. It's five out of 22 in our example. So basically, you end up with a net promoter score of 18. And um, please note that if you had all detractors and no promoters, and neutral doesn't matter, it just gets kicked out. But if you had all detractors, you could actually have a net promoter score of negative 100. So when people look at this and say, oh, 18, that looks terrible, you actually have to put in the context of it, it could be negative. Um, there are a lot of firms that are moving to, to this. In, in Canada, McCarthy Tetro, who's one of the largest firms, has actually started doing net promoter um with with their clients and the firms that i work with we encourage them to do the why or why not because you should be doing this survey and tracking who's answering this because when you do a survey you want to make sure there's some sort of follow-up it's really interesting there's an entire book written on this and um you know this is something obviously that started outside the law but if there's all this um research about how if you're happy about something, you're much less likely to share it than if you're upset. And for those of you who have been under a rock, I mean, you can't go anywhere without seeing anything about United Airlines in the last couple of days. So you can see how people like to complain about things. It's human nature. So you really want to be able to identify the people that you are, uh, that are detractors from your firm. So that's, um, it's, it's a really interesting uh, approach. But one of the things that is a caveat with all of these KPIs is that you have to be willing to change. And whether you're at a firm or you're at a company, you can adapt these to, to whatever you're doing. Another interesting KPI that comes from outside the, um, outside the, the law is looking at your pipeline, looking at your potential clients more as a um, more as a, uh, a sales type pipeline. And there's a quick example here, which I'm not going to go into because I don't think we have enough time, um, is that you can look at your practice and decide what types of matters you have. And it's one of those things where it becomes very much um, an art rather than a science. So you want to look and measure your uh, potential matters and decide how much, you know, how much, what is the likelihood that you are actually going to get the work and that the work is going to go ahead because this can help you plan for staffing. And um, the small clients or small firm clients that I've worked with, this is one of the things where they struggle because if everything lands all in one month, then they don't have enough time for it. Or if it's the other, they don't have enough coming down the, you know, on their books as potential work, then they're looking for things for, for people to do, which of course isn't good. Um, so it's interesting because I just did a CLE on this at Arizona um, Arizona Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law, which is really long um, to say. But when I was there, one of the the lawyers does he does contingency work, and he has over the years grouped his types of clients. So he has about six different clients, and he can predict pretty well how much the settlements are going. He groups those clients and then he figures out his staffing based on that. So he's pretty excited because he's been practicing for like 35 years. He was excited that he already had this, this KPI in place. Um, and I, this is one of the things that um, we, through Evolve Live, met a lot of people who help attorneys with their billings. And um, there seems to be a reluctance in the, in the profession to actually follow up on these billings, even in large firms. I remember that we were told that the, that the, that uh, we weren't allowed to call any of the clients. You're not allowed to send anything in to collections. 
So um, a, a friend of mine uh, has a firm where she helps small firms with these collections and she works backwards to get these targets because the idea is that if you have to pay all your bills within 30 days, but you only collect your revenue in 60 days, who's going to pay the difference? Um, so you have to have a tolerance for how much can be late versus how much can be, um, you know, how much needs to be in the door to pay your bills. And I will skip over this, but this is a way if you don't, don't have age, they are, some of the systems out there don't show it, you can actually figure this out. And I'm happy to send in the slides that can be posted on SlideShare or wherever you'd like afterwards. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about was that many firms um, don't dive into a matter by matter uh, analysis. And this is something that is really important uh, if you're if you're struggling with your different types of matters, because uh, you may be um, you you may be overall doing okay, but you might have matters that are drawing on your resources versus others. Um, so, just a couple of tips. Um, there's a uh, the wealth. Uh, Wealth Plan Law Group out of um, out of New Orleans. They have their client survey. Uh, they do Net Promoter Score, and then they do do a couple of other questions. And they make it super easy for their clients to gather this data because when their their wills and estates attorneys, when they're actually sitting down with them to sign all the documents, then they hand them the survey on an iPad while they're you know while they're photocopying all their documents. Uh, I mentioned McCarthy Tetro. They started out by doing um, their net promoter score on a small group, um, and then they've been working on a client-wide pipeline. And uh, Billy Tarasio, who's presented with me at Clio a couple of years ago, she found out all kinds of things by doing the net promoter score and asking people why or why not. Um, she found out things about her staff, about her practices, and then we calculated how much money she was spending acquiring clients, and she changed her whole process based on that. So one last point is that for targets, people are always going, I don't know what to do. Again, this is not your financial statements. It's like a, a art. And so you really just want to get started, but you don't start, you, you start by looking at what your goals are for your, for your practice. And in the interest of time, I will, will just skip to questions. <laughs> if there are any questions. Great, Mary, thanks. How, how does this translate from the sort of the firm management, thinking about the firm thus as a whole and finding new metrics for measuring the performance of the firm into down to the individual associate or paralegal how how what kind of kpis should the firm have for them so other than um, billable hours other than billable hours exactly so the the way that i structured this framework which i can just go back to tried to map flow, um, the performance which is the the fifth category get individual performance. And one of the, the missing pieces often is that the performance, if you're not going to measure on billable hours, you have to make sure then any bonuses and any compensation is now going to be reflected by the however you're measuring them. So it boils down to associates, you want to have people um, measured on what they can control. So if it's budget versus actual, if it's um, instead their uh, their collections, uh, one of the projects that I, they had for their paralegals, they they were given time frames, not like billable hours, but the project had to be finished within two weeks. So you're either green or red, and you know the number of tasks that were completed on time. So it's really trying to figure out how are you going to reward people and then figure out those individual performance metrics. Got it. Yeah, other questions for Mary? One question. Yeah. How, how likely, Mary, do you think it is that the 
smaller, less business-oriented firms will truly, you know, uh, come to view their firm as a genuine business as opposed to perhaps being acquired or put out of business by those firms that just end up being much higher performing because they end up adapt adapting these metrics and in turn, because of these metrics are probably driven to adapt smarter technologies that have helped them improve the metrics. Um, I think a lot of solos actually are, are, they embrace this because it's pretty simple. The way that I did this framework was that you didn't actually have to have any technology. There's, you know, information in the book all about, um, you know, the simple systems that you can have or not have. And the whole thing is done based on Excel. Um, I've got some folks who are you know, now playing with things like Airtable because Tableau is too expensive for the small firms. So um, it's, I think the solos are the ones who, who will, if they embrace this, it's not that hard. And I don't envision a lawyer sitting down and doing this themselves. I see it more as they have a basic understanding and then they hand it over to their admin or they hand it over to their um, to their uh, accountant or whoever does their reporting. And then they just set up the framework and start using it. I'm seeing solos and small being more nimble in adopting the technology once they know how much it's cost them to acquire a client, they start shopping for things like automatic calendars and some of these other things to, to reduce the technology. And things like Tom's product, like the LawDroid, those things can be, enabling technologies can be really helpful. Mary, uh, somebody chatted online um, asking, uh, it's RP asking, um, you know, we use NPS daily. Can you provide an example of the NPS why or why not question in an NPS survey? Provide an example. So when you send out as like end of engagement or however you want to do it, you just put a box so people, so you say, how would you rate? So if I give a, a 10, the why might be, you know, because you solved, you solved my problem or I so and so, but then the why not could come along with um, a lower ranking or even uh, neutral because your goal is with the NPS to go back and try to, you know, resurvey in when it's appropriate um, and to, to fix things. Um, you know, one of the biggest complaints uh, that people give for the why not is that uh, lawyers are terrible communicators, so they don't hear from their lawyer enough. And that's one of the things that several law firms have learned when um, when they put in the why or why not. And you also will get people specifically saying, so-and-so doesn't answer my phone calls or so-and-so doesn't answer my e emails to, to deal with that type of feedback. All right. Tom has a question? Mary, I have a question for you. Besides the uh, you know the lack of communication thing, which we know is like the number one complaint that people have, what, what are some other uh, issues that people have come up with in, in answering the NPS? Like you know, that client tab. Like what are, what are problems with client tab with lawyers that we could try to fix? Or well, some 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 lawyers have told me that their clients are upset with the you know the billing practices, like the way they got the bill, the way the bill, sort of a little bit of the communication side. Um, you know, occasionally people are surprised by a bill, which that's never good um, at all. So so there hasn't really been a lot of, my, my understanding is there there is not a lot of the, you lost my case, so I'm going to give you a one, which is concern why people sometimes, I mean, we're human. Nobody wants to be rated poorly. Um, so you don't really want to ask, uh, but the, the communication is a big one. And then a lack of using technology. Um, that's my own personal feedback for some of the people that I have been a client of uh, is, you know, it's just too cumbersome, you know, to fill in all these documents by hand. Why, why aren't we using DocuSign? Why aren't we using? So there's a lot of pushback by clients that way. Great. Great. Any final question for Mary? That was great. Thanks, yeah. Mary. Oh, thank all right. You. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. It seems like.
somebody chat here on the can you read that? I can't yeah. read that. Okay, oh, I that's see. right. You don't have it in Yeah. Oh, they were just finessing the whole yeah, MPS yeah, thread. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, um, thank you. Thank oh, you. Oh, there's both. a question oh. is it, it's not a required field. The why did you, why or why not question, it, it's not required. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. All right. All right. Well, Tom and Mary, thank you so so much again for coming in. And uh, yeah, pretty much at the end of our time. Our next uh, meeting is when? Next Disney? week. Next week. Okay. So. All right. See you again next week. All right. Thank you all for for coming. Thank you.